Welcome to this first PowerPoint presentation on the topic of aggression. When I teach this class in person, one of the ways I sometimes start this part of the course is to simply ask the class to define what aggression is, what makes a behavior aggressive. And I get a lot of interesting responses, and some of them sound okay when you first hear them, but then when I ask a few questions, people are uncertain. And part of the reason the question is so frustrating is aggression is a very complicated topic. You can focus on the intentions of the person before performing the behavior. You can focus on the effects of the behavior on others. Uh, you can talk about whether or not there's an internal emotion that comes along with it. And all the explanations that I get from my students uh, touch on all these different bases. So we end up not exactly defining what aggression is as much as we acknowledge that there are different types of aggression. And this is the way that most social psychologists tend to think about aggression. So there are a variety of different ways to think about it. First, there's hostile aggression. This is the type of aggression that we often think of uh, because it's triggered by emotions. The person has a strong feeling of anger and lashes out in some way. So aggression that's driven by a negative emotion is called hostile aggression. There's also instrumental aggression. This is aggression that helps you accomplish some goal. So to take a silly example, let's suppose I'm a, a hitman who gets hired uh, by people to kill other people. Well, I report to work in the morning and I get the information about the person that I'm supposed to kill that day. Well, I don't hate this person. I don't have any negative emotions. I don't know anything about this individual, but killing that individual is a means to help me accomplish something else, meaning I get a paycheck. So instrumental aggression is aggression that's performed uh, for the purpose of achieving a goal of some sort. Now notice that these different categories that I'm describing are not mutually exclusive. I can engage in instrumental aggression that's also hostile. Uh, so this is not a clean way of distinguishing all types of aggression from each other, but it's just a way of describing uh, the different reasons that aggression can occur. Antisocial aggression is aggression that violates the norms or rules of the group in which the people are. Uh, so the picture you see there, you probably can't make it out too well. These are pictures from the security camera at Columbine High School. Uh, these are the two famous shooters from that school shooting, one of the first big ones that occurred. So aggression that everybody in a society agrees is against the rules, something none of us want would be classified as antisocial aggression. Pro-social aggression, on the other hand, is aggression that is done on behalf of the group. And sometimes it's even required. So a soldier in the military is required to fight the enemy on behalf of his or her country. And if the person refuses to do that, that individual may actually be put in prison. So some aggression is rewarded because it serves the interests of the group. Then there's sanctioned aggression. Sanctioned as aggression is aggression that isn't necessarily required by a society, but it's certainly permitted. So the kinds of aggression that takes place in sports, for example, uh, as long as it's within the rules, is considered okay. A person who behaves aggressively in self-defense is also given a pass because that kind of aggression is all right. So as you can see, uh, defining what aggression is is tricky because there are actually many different types of aggression. We could also make this even more complicated by making a distinction between physical aggression, where a person uh, is inflicting bodily harm on another person, versus verbal aggression, where maybe the individual is gossiping or insulting or belittling somebody in public. In this section of the course, we're going to focus primarily on hostile and antisocial aggression, because these are the types of aggression that tend to cause the most trouble the things that people worry the most about. We're always on our guard against um, individuals losing their temper, um, going off. Uh, we've got all kinds of going postal. We've got all kinds of expressions to reflect the fact that a person becomes 
overwhelmed by emotion and therefore can become dangerous. So we're going to talk about that a lot. We're also going to talk about antisocial aggression um, as physical aggression. If you're walking down a dark city street late at night, you're not usually worried about somebody jumping out of the shadows and insulting you. You're worried about a physical assault. So yes, we will talk about these different forms of aggression, but we're going to emphasize hostile antisocial aggression. Social psychologists have been studying aggression for a long time, and they've identified a large number of things that in situations tend to increase levels of aggression in people. Uh, the list that you see on this slide is not an exhaustive list. There are certainly other factors besides these, but this is just a sampling of some of the things that have been studied that seem to influence um, or trigger aggression. Let's start with the topic of hot temperatures. On the day that I'm recording this PowerPoint slide, it's 95 degrees in Galesburg and it's humid. And if I spend too much time outside away from the air conditioning, I find myself getting uncomfortable and a little crabby and I'm in an unpleasant mood. So we all have that common sense notion that as you get hot, uh, you get cranky and perhaps you're more likely to behave aggressively. But what have we actually learned about this from research? Uh, there are two different types of studies done to test this. In laboratory studies, they typically bring people into the laboratory. Uh, they give them an opportunity to behave aggressively toward another person, often by delivering electric shock or loud bursts of noise to another subject in the experiment. And the independent variable is the temperature of the room in which the subject is located. In these laboratory studies, they tend to find what we call a curvilinear relationship between temperature and levels of aggression. That is, as it gets hotter, people do in fact get more aggressive up to a certain point. And that point seems to be in the high 80 degree range Fahrenheit. So when it gets up around 88 degrees or so, it peaks. But then if it gets even hotter than that, uh, levels of aggression tend to drop off. So in laboratory studies, this is what we typically find. Field studies of aggression come to a somewhat different conclusion. In field studies, they simply uh, get archival records of the, uh, for example, the temperature, the high temperature in a city on a particular date, and then they get measures of things like arrests for violent crime, such as assault and murder and rape and to just do a correlational study to see if there's any relationship. These studies show a strong linear relationship between temperature and aggression. As it gets hotter, people get more aggressive and levels of aggression don't seem to come down um, after a certain point the way they do in laboratory studies. There have actually been some fairly clever ways of testing this. Um, one of my favorite studies looked at pitchers in baseball games uh, hitting batters. Do more batters get hit by pitches as the temperature gets hotter? And the answer to the question is a clear yes. Pitchers are hitting batters more often on hot days. And we know that it isn't just because the pitcher doesn't have as much control. It's not because the ball is slippery because the pitcher is sweating or the pitcher is tired because it's hot because other things that would reveal that the pitcher was losing control, a number of walks, for example, doesn't go up. They're just throwing the ball at batters as it gets hotter. And so uh, this is another field study that shows uh, that aggression always goes up with hot temperatures. If I were to ask you a question about the relationship between temperature and aggression on a quiz, I would have to be very careful to ask you the question uh, in the form of based on laboratory studies versus based on field studies because they do indicate different things. So at this point, I think we're all comfortable saying that temperature and aggression are definitely linked, but exactly what the nature of that relationship is, is still sort of open to question. Some of the other variables on the list have a much clearer relationship with aggression. Noise, for example. When people are 
exposed to loud, irritating, unpredictable noise, they do in fact behave more aggressively. And there doesn't seem to be any uh, exception to how that works. It also won't come as any surprise to you to hear that alcohol consumption and aggression often go together. When people get arrested late on a Friday or Saturday night for fighting or some other kind of violent um, misbehavior, uh, not surprisingly, alcohol is often involved. And laboratory studies confirm that, in fact, when you bring people into the laboratory, give them doses of alcohol, and then allow them to, say, give electric shocks to another subject, uh, alcohol has an effect. Now, it turns out in very small quantities, just a little bit of alcohol, uh, people actually become a little less aggressive. But when you go beyond that minimum amount, uh, higher levels of alcohol consumption do tend to be related to more aggressive behavior. One kind of fun study actually indicated that the type of alcohol people are drinking uh, may have an effect. They identified something they called the terrible Ivan effect, where people who were drinking vodka behaved more aggressively than people who were drinking some other kind of alcohol. One of the more apt, one of the more active areas of research has been on the topic of um, the effect that aggression eliciting cues have on aggression. What this means is if you're in a situation where there are cues around you that are associated with aggression, these cues prime aggressive thoughts in you and make it more likely that you will behave aggressively. And there are two kinds of aggression eliciting cues. Uh, sometimes something can be an aggression eliciting cue because it's associated with someone or something that's been a source of anger or frustration to you. So for example, if I have made you very angry for some reason, any cue that reminds you of me could be an aggression eliciting cue. Other cues, like weapons, for example, are aggression eliciting cues because they're intimately associated with violence and aggression. That's why they exist. There have been a great many laboratory studies on this, and um, I talk about this at some length in class, and it gets a little too complicated to get into detail on a recorded PowerPoint. But the gist of it is, if people are in situations where there are aggression eliciting cues around them, they do tend to behave more aggressively. And this also turns out to be true in field studies as well. Uh, one popular study described a pickup truck that drove around the city of Salt Lake City all day on a Saturday between 9 and 5. At stoplights, the truck would wait for 12 seconds before it would start moving after a light turned green. And for those of you that drive, you know that 12 seconds is an eternity uh, when you're waiting for a car in front of you to move when the light turns green. Well, the pickup truck had three different conditions throughout the day. In one condition, uh, it had a military rifle in a rifle rack on the back of the truck and a bumper sticker that said vengeance. In another condition, uh, it had the military rifle, but now a bumper sticker that said friend. And in a third condition, uh, the gun rack was empty and there were no bumper stickers on the truck at all. The dependent variable in this study was whether people haunt the horn or not to make the truck move after the light turned green. And in spite of what you might think you might do, they found there was a very clear effect. 60% uh, of the subjects in the experiment honked when there was a military rifle and a vengeance bumper sticker. Only 38% honked their horn when the bumper sticker said friend, and only 27% honked their horn when the gun rack was empty and there were no bumper stickers at all. And these were statistically significant differences. So the presence of cues associated with aggression uh, do in fact tend to elicit aggressive behavior. In another PowerPoint, I'll talk in more depth about a study we did at Knox College that showed that just having men handle guns uh, raises their testosterone levels, which then causes them to behave more aggressively. Something else that affects aggression in situations is a person's level of arousal. Uh, in an earlier part of the course, we talked about how heightened levels of arousal can be misattributed and uh, lead you to be more attracted to someone. Well, the same thing can happen with aggression. If your adrenaline levels are high and your heart is pounding and the surroundings indicate 
that there's perhaps an, aggress an aggressive reason for this, you will interpret your feelings as anger or aggression and make yourself more likely to act out. And this is going to be especially true if the personality of the individual uh, in question uh, is predisposed toward aggressiveness. I'm not going to talk too much about personality here, but uh, for example, a person high in narcissism who has his or her unrealistically high self-esteem challenged by someone might react quite aggressively. Or an extreme type A person is very competitive and irritable, maybe more prone to aggression than others. So some people, by nature of their personality, are going to respond in a more aggressive fashion to some kinds of situations than other people will. In the next few PowerPoint presentations, uh, we're going to be talking about theoretical perspectives on aggression. We just finished talking about what some of the triggers for aggressive behavior are, what some of the things that in any given situation might uh, cause a person to behave aggressively, but that ignores the long range explanation as to why some things provoke aggression. And psychologists and social scientists in general have taken very different positions on this. So we're going to examine something called the frustration aggression hypothesis. We're also going to take a look at what Sigmund Freud had to say about aggression. We'll talk at some length about social learning theory, which is probably the dominant way of thinking about aggression in the social sciences, including psychology. And I will also spend a fair bit of time uh, talking about evolutionary psychological perspectives on aggression.